Welcome to this Talks at Google virtual event. I'm Sara Madan, and I'm a display test engineer working on Nest Display products at Google. As you think of questions throughout this conversation, please be sure to add them to the live chat on the right. I'm thrilled to introduce today's guest, Rani Kohinoor, AKA Sushant Divgikar. They are an artist, a singer, a certified therapist, and a champion of equality. They have won more awards than I can remember. And if you've heard their performance of Pia Tu Ab To Aja, you know that their vocal range can only be described as pure magic. Sushant recently also announced to the world that, that the full extent of their gender goes beyond binary gender descriptors and they're using they, them pronouns in addition to he, him, and she, her pronouns. As a trans person who grew up in Chandigarh around the same time that Sushant was growing up, I'm extremely grateful for the work they're doing to show a path to the queer trans Indian community that is outside of the confines of shame that so often drag us down. While being a drag icon, they have always spoken truth to power. And even though their story is a unique one, it is also uniquely Indian in that it's a story of family, it's a story of resilience and hope, and it's a story of understanding India's cultural identity struggle within the context of colonialism. To me, their experiences with their family are also a blueprint for what I hope more queer and trans Indian lives could look like. And the way they tell their story, it always makes me tear up because perhaps I wish my own story was closer to theirs. Sushant, it is my pleasure to welcome you to Talks at Google. Thank you so much, Sarah. And it's my pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for accommodating me in this wonderful, uh, on this wonderful platform. And you look gorgeous today. I love the sari and I love the look at, and, and then you wear the smile the best. That's what you're wearing the best today, your smile. Thank you so, so thank much. you so much for having me. Thank you so much for being a guest today. <laughs> so I've spoken a lot about you from my viewpoint, but you know, because every human being is, is has more dimensions than anyone can ever capture uh, in, in words. I want you to introduce yourself today. <laughs> well, I am Sushant Geeker, um, also known as Rani Kohinoor, and um, my preferred pronouns are he, she, and they. Um, and, you know, when people ask me why all those pronouns is because I think I have accepted my fluidity to its optimum. Um, apart from that, I think your uh, your introduction made, made me tear up, uh, Sarah. In, you know, I was like, where I need to touch up before we go live because this one's making me cry, you know. <laughs> and I think you've done a great job uh, of introducing me. But uh, thank you so much for all that you said and all that you, um, you know, shared with the audience today. And it's just, it's, it's so... Um, it's so surreal being here with you and having this conversation. And yeah, we also spoke the other day, but, uh, um, and then we shared so much, but I can't wait for us to share all of that with everyone else now. Me too. So, you know, you were just saying that recently, um, you, you know, like um, that you use pro pronouns, um, you know, he, she, and they, and, and um, just for our audience, um, it's, it's this pronouns, pronoun they is often used by non-binary people. And I couldn't find a lot of like content about you talking about that side of you. I know that's like a new development that I, it's a new development in the sense that new development that you shared with people. I'm sure there was a lot going behind the scenes. There was a lot longer um, contemplation of this. And so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how that experience was. Yes, it was very, it, it is very uh, nascent. I would say my announcement, but my expression has always been very fluid. Uh, right from the time I started doing television, uh, in Indian television, I mean, um, when I was a teenager. And I always, you know, used to tell my stylist, there used to be a stylist and she used to hate me because she used to both and get something that looked very heteronormative and it, it looked like something even my father wouldn't wear. And I was like, uh, what, who have you bought this, got this for? Who have you sourced this for? Do you not like your job? 
Uh, and then uh, she used to be like, this is for you. I said, I'm hosting the show. I'm not ghosting it. And then, uh, you know, and then she was like, uh, so that's the, that's the moment I realized that I can't be wearing, you know, this because it doesn't, it doesn't uh, authentically portray what I want to through my uh, expression, you know. And so back then I didn't even know what gender fluidity was, what non being non-binary was. I knew I was gay because I'd come out to my family. And um, I, I knew I was attracted to men, but I didn't know so much about myself. So that journey of self-exploration happened over the years. Although I was uh, evidently androgynous and fluid in my expression as well, I didn't know what to term it. Uh, that only happened this year. After 15 years of being an entertainer, I realized that, okay, I am I am non-binary and, you know, these are my pronouns and this is how I'm supposed to talk uh, to people about it uh, so that they, and it's great to have questions, you know. I always say that, you know, when people get confused, they ask me, what should we call you he, should we call you she, should we call you something else? And then I tell them that, you know, I am comfortable personally with he, she, and they as pronouns because I accept my fluidity and I celebrate it every day. So um, it was a journey. and uh, But this year, this is the year 2021, when I officially came out as non-binary um, to uh, an event that I did. And when I told my parents and I explained to them what it means and that, you know, being non-binary also it falls under the larger trans umbrella, uh, you know, they took a little, they took a while because this was my third coming out story to them. And I said, and then they were like, oh, so does this, does this mean you want to transition? I said, no, but not to say that I might not consider it. You see, because, you know, you learn so much new about yourself every day, every minute, you know. So I said, I don't know about that. But for now, I am gender non-confirming. And then I explained it to them. <laughs> Sorry, my dad actually sat and listened. My mother was like, now, you know, I don't know. Now, I, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, I, the first time was, you know, uh, I was a little like, whatever. Now you do whatever you want. It's fine. So she's like, now I have nothing to say or react to. So I said, you know, that's, that's beautiful because my parents really haven't ever judged me for my orientation, my gender, my... Um, my choices in life, my vocational choices, none of it. Uh, and they've just always supported me unconditionally and just given me unconditional love. And then I think that that I'm very grateful for. And that has actually helped me uh, portray and celebrate my individuality even more. That's amazing. Yeah, that is really amazing. You know, it's all, it's always a journey for, for many of us. It's, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I recently had this sort of revelation about all the things I wanted to do, even though I transitioned 10 years ago. So it's it's really complicated. Um, but, you know, I've heard from a lot of non-binary friends that um, sometimes, you know, being non-binary itself can feel prescriptive and confining because, um, you know, just like a label of man or woman can feel prescriptive and confining because it has this expectation that every single day you have to be gender non-conforming. Like every single day you have to wear an androgynous, like, um, clothing, you know, and so how do you feel about like all these these labels that the queer and trans community uses, um, including the labels of queer and trans themselves? Do you believe they add value? Do they just confine us? Honestly, I think, and this is my personal opinion, I think that there is a lot of inverse discrimination even within the community. Uh, there are a lot of expectations as to how queer a queer person should be or how trans a trans person should be as you articulate uh, you know articulated it very well and you know in in the question you also sort of answered it you know if you uh, it, it, it was beautiful so i honestly think that uh, we cannot uh, impose our uh, mindsets or our ways of thinking onto someone else's being uh, you know, it it might sound very simple, but it's very intense and deep because um, I might have certain notions about gender, about myself, but those notions, I mean, congratulations to me on those notions, 
about myself. But if I have to superimpose that onto someone else, I'm not being any better than somebody who doesn't understand this at all. Um, so both you and I, we come from an Indian family and, and we all know how strong, you know, a lot of the audience today is from India. We all know how strong the bonds of family in, in Indian culture can be. And my own experience with that was that after I moved to London uh, and came out to them, to my parents as trans, um, that was about 11 years ago, you know, we went through this K3G like drama of my family disowning me. And, and, and without that support, things really got very difficult for me. I struggled through homelessness for a bit. I struggled through depression for a very long time. Um, fortunately for me, I got a scholarship to get a PhD in the US, which eventually brought me to Google. But that entire journey, it was, it was that much harder without that, that love and support of my family. And, and even after that, it took many years, a long time for my family to come around to accepting me. And, and my dad, he still hasn't quite come around. And all that, it left a really like, you know, deep scar of shame that, that took like almost a decade to overcome. And to some extent, I still struggle to like trust people, uh, especially in like close relationships. Um, but I still have, hold out hope that, that someday I'll be reunited with my family and that my dad will accept my apology messages for, for not trying harder to bring him along on this journey that, that I went through for so long. So could you tell our audience uh, what your experience around your family was, you know, and, and how like how um, differences in these experiences, like how they can create either like create and strengthen a structure of shame or it can create a culture of love, which goes, you know, significantly above just acceptance. Um, <clears throat> my parents uh you know, my uh, entire support system, because uh, the first people that I came out to uh, were them. You know, surprisingly, I had, I came out to one friend and, uh, and my brother was dating that friend. So she's the one who told him. And uh, he's the one who went and told my father. I was planning to come out to my father the next week. I was anyway planning to come out of the closet, but um, my father just, randomly one day asked me he said you know your brother told me that um you attend gay parties and queer lgbt events uh so are you gay and uh i was like not ready for it i was uh and i just i i without flinching i said yes i am dad and without flinching he said that okay um and he asked me uh, asked me a very uh you know, a very funny question. Uh, but then he just said, you know what, wait, listen, I'm doing this wrong. I might not understand this completely, but you must know that whether you're gay or straight, you're whatever, you're my child first. You're not my gay child or my straight child, you're my child. And for me, as an, I get emotional even talking about it today, And um, for me, um, as an 18 year old, that that just gave me the strength to do whatever I wanted to do, you know. And then he just gave me a big hug. And, you know, he told me after giving me a hug that, you know, from today onwards, I am going to make more of an effort to understand you. And uh, understand your community. So, you know, it, it was very emotional, but I always say that I wouldn't have been where I am without my parents. And um, my mom, of course, on the other hand, was very dramatic, but she was not, uh, you know, dramatic in a way which she was, it was very funny, actually. She was watching a television serial. Uh, she was watching a television show and she was like, move, why are you in front of the television? You know, I'm, you know, you're spoiling my show. And I said, mom, but it's something very important that I have to tell you. And before I went to tell her, my father actually asked me whether I need help in telling my mom. You know, I honestly thought that I would first come out to mom and then dad. But then, you know, that that's not what happened because my brother couldn't keep it in his stomach. And he went and told my father. So my father asked me, he actually asked me whether you need any help coming out to your mom. And... Um, 
I said, no, I mean, I want to have this conversation like I did with you uh, very unexpectedly, but I want to have this conversation with her myself. So he said, yeah, okay, go ahead. If you need anything, I'm there. And she was watching a television show. I didn't know I shouldn't have disturbed her. But uh, <laughs> so I came and then she was like, can we please talk in the commercial break? I said, this is life changing. This is something monumental, you know, for my life. And she was like, she mutes the television and says, if this is about you being gay, I already know. I'm your mother. I know everything. I was like, okay, I mean, is that, is this it? You know, because uh, <laughs> I didn't, I honestly didn't expect it to be so smooth sailing. I, I knew my parents were very, uh, you know, whether they were conservative or whether they came from a middle-class family, um, that didn't matter to them because for them, their children were everything. Their children, the happiness of their children was everything to them. And my father said something very beautiful. He said that, you know, whenever he gives speeches and talks, he tells other parents that I have not done anything special as a parent. All that I've done as a parent is what a parent should do for the child. And that is only unconditionally love the child. Um, and for me, that I think, you know, just gave me all the strength I needed to go and face the world. And I know how tough it must have been for you, Sarah. But, you know, that's why they say that, you know, even within the community, uh, I have a lot of children drag children queer children that some of some of them are even older than i am uh chronologically and uh, they still call me mother because and and my mom said something very beautiful she said you might not be able to give birth but motherhood is an emotion and you know so I, 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 I didn't expect that I'd get so emotional, but I have such wonderful children and I have such wonderful sisters, siblings, brothers within the community and outside of it today. And I'm so thankful for the upbringing and for whatever um, my parents have inculcated in me. You know, uh, it was beautiful parenting. And I'm so sorry that um, you may not have had the same journey, but, you know, look at you today. And I'm sure somewhere in their Desi hearts, they're very proud of you and they're they're definitely going to reunite with you very soon. And uh, I love the fact that, you know, you, you shared with me about your grandmother and your family and the other day. And I'm sure all of them somewhere down the line know for a fact that, you know, this is a this is a guard that they have created, but they know deep down that they they, you know, they care for you and they love you. So that's what I learned through my journey is that. Uh, you know, when you, my father said this and he's too funny also, but uh, he said uh, at one uh, conference that, you know, I brought my children into this world. It wasn't their choice. Uh, so if I choose now to abandon them for their gender or orientation, that just makes me a very crappy parent. Uh, so I don't care what you think about my child because you're not paying our bills. You know, and I was like, okay, dad, have you been watching RuPaul? Because you're stealing all her one-liners, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, this is, you know, um, it feels so familiar being 18 and coming out to your parents for the first time. And that part is so familiar. And, you know, um, lately when I've had a much better relationship with at least my mom and, and some of my extended family, it's been... It's been beautiful, like reconnecting with her as her daughter. It's um, so yeah. Hearing your story, it just always makes me feel like I wish everybody's story could be that happy from from the get go. You know? Yeah, but you know, I'll tell you something else. My mother keeps telling all my um, uh, you know aunts and uh, you know cousins, aunts that have sons, my cousin brothers. She says you will have to share your jewelry with your daughter-in-law. I'm going to give all of it to Sushant so it stays in the house. Can you believe it? My mother is like, <laughs> She's like, my saris and my jewelry are not going to go to my daughter-in-law. They're going to go to Sushant. Such an Indian mother. You because, yeah, you know how in Indian weddings you have to give shagun. You have to give the family heirlooms. 
the daughter in law to welcome her into the uh, family my mother is like that's not happening with me i'm giving it to sushant <laughs> that's crazy <laughs> <laughs> so i i want to change gears a little bit and you know talk a little bit about the, like the 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 privilege difference in india because you know both you and i um despite all these differences we both come from relatively liberal cities and and now at this point we're both somewhat privileged you know in terms of education in terms of safety and emotional support that sure. we have you on top of it are incredibly famous <laughs> um but you know many people in small towns small towns in india they don't have that privilege so like how do you think we can spread this message of love uh to smaller towns where queer and trans kids are probably suffering even more what's your message to those kids or to their parents um Sarah uh, you know a lot of people you know tell me that I've won this award and that award and I've been on the cover of Vogue and this and that and the other I've traveled the world you know none of those are my biggest accomplishments my biggest accomplishment is when I was on television completely accepting my gender fluidity in 2018 is also the year when they decriminalized section 377 so I made a comeback on television and I said you know i want to go back on television not because i miss television i did not miss television let me tell you the workers were crazy crazy i didn't have a social life at all you know because i was working for 17 hours 16 hours you know and then come back i i didn't I hardly had any time to sleep and all of that my health was going for a toss um so i didn't really want to come back on television for anything else but to show everybody that i'm so comfortable with myself now at this stage in my life i'm so comfortable with my fluidity and i came on television i just uh, you know appeared on television in 2018 and uh in my drag of that so before that in mainstream media and on television nobody had done it and I, you know why i did it because i was performing before that but i did it on television because i know that i'm privileged I know that I have the love of my family. I know I have the power of education. I know a lot of kids that don't, and I know a lot of parents that probably might be as fantastic as my parents, but because of societal pressure, and because of not knowing better, they might disown their children. And I said nothing doing. I have to get on television like this, you know, in as Rani Kohinoor, and win their hearts. the parents and make them understand that i could stand here in front of crores and billions of people around the world and in india because my parents were with me so if you are with your parents and if you are with your children and you give them the love that they deserve then you know they will only make you proud they can only go above and beyond after that you know there's no looking back from there so my biggest i would say achievement is that my, the power of my art could connect to even children queer children queer people closeted queer people individuals there's so much intersectionality in the indian queer community if you are a queer person if you are muslim if you are of uh, another um uh, you know caste if you are uh, of a of something you know you there is caste system unfortunately even today in in uh, in india and you know somebody from the lower caste i hate saying this but you know someone who is dalit that is the they call it lower caste can you believe it it's not even it's it, i have to, i cringe every time i have to even so you know i don't say that but you know the what they consider in their heads lower than them so now if that person is people with uh, you know um who are specially able to handicapped and are queer so there are so many intersectionalities i wanted to get there on stage not do it do this for the privileged metropolitan queers i wanted to do it for the ones in the smaller towns and the smaller cities the tier three cities where people don't know better and when they saw me and you know sure enough that's what happened because they were like uh, you know uh, when it went viral my songs i i couldn't believe that it went viral i was like i was just doing what i do every day but the power 
that you know that art and the fact that you were true to yourself there were people uh, you won't believe it like from tier 3 and tier 2 cities and towns and in the comment section there used to be one bad comment and 2000 nice comments you know i was so humble and that one bad comment would be are ye to chakka hai ye you know oh my god what is this you know he's not a man he's not a woman what is it you know is it a it such derogatory stuff you know then people some people were like this person should die you know this person these are the people who spoil the fabric of our society and culture and then you should have seen sara the comments under that there were people from smaller towns who were not even queer said that don't look at the gender look at the art the gender is there but that's not all everything about the person and why are you so threatened by somebody else's gender these were people from tier 2 and tier 3 and small town cities and towns so for me i i realized then that you know like listen we are taking them for granted we are not giving them as much credit as is due so i realized that that really really and i want to tell everybody listening to this whether you're from a metropolitan or from a small town or from villages or wherever you're from you know accept your true identity live your true true life truest life because once you're comfortable with yourself everybody else around you won't have a uh, you know they won't have an option but to just celebrate your authentic self yeah yeah you want to remove that log kya kahenge uh you know thing that people say that parents say often yes uh, so you know you're talking about like representation in media and you know when i think of representation in indian media i i remember like all these tropes about queer and trans people from like a decade ago uh, every time i would see a character that's played by you know bobby darling it was always used as a punchline to either ridicule or dehumanize queer queer and trans people nowadays when i watch bollywood movies i don't see that as much but then i also don't see any positively framed lgbtq plus characters so i what i see is largely like a minimization of our lives like we don't even exist what are your thoughts on how the media and and bollywood has changed and how do you see it changing and how do you want it to change well um when it comes to queer representation and lgbtqi plus characters per se i think bollywood has a lot of blood on their hands because they have mis not only misrepresented but they have ridiculed the community they have um made fun of us they have dehumanized us and they have made always sensationalized and not normalized queer characters every time there used to be a queer character there used to be some funky music in the back you know trying to demean us show us you know as negative i'll never forget that you know there was this one movie uh, where there was this gay character this queer, uh, very uh, overtly effeminate character and they you know it, it was uh, it was a caricature really it was so badly done and you know i am overtly effeminate as well like even with my expression but i would never speak like that i would never talk like that i would not throw myself at every man like that what are we some sexual predators how are you showing you know and time and time again it was not even like one you know one off it was every film there used to be a queer character it used to that used to be the outline and i'm sorry you know i want to take this opportunity to apologize to artists like bobby darling because you know she didn't have a choice she had to pay her bills she had to take the work that was given to her because at that time she couldn't just say that you know no i would i you know i want to revolt and i want to create a you know after a point after she did a couple of films she said i'm now no more i can't do this anymore but you know for me also i mean when i get scripts some of the scripts are terrible they are in fact i can actually go and sue these people that send me these scripts because i i'm like if you're going to put this out you really really need to sit with yourself and ask yourself from where is all of this coming and in what year are you you're in 2021 where there is no time to hate people judge people whether uh, you know you're you're a man you're a woman you're non binary you're transgender it doesn't matter you're human first and your 
for us we are an artist first and then everything later and you know i would play any character but where are the scripts what do you want me to do you do you want me to play like a a, a transgender tree at the back behind the the heterosexual male and female uh, you know cis gendered we are always the other the side characters for what why what, what are they missing so uh, and then you know then they'll also have this thing about they'll create queer cinema they'll que- create queer roles and have heterosexual people playing them yeah. i don't have a problem with heterosexual people playing queer roles i don't but only heterosexual p- people will play cisgendered heterosexual roles they'll play bisexual they'll play transgender they'll play the neighbor they'll play a college kid they'll play the their own father in the film and do a double role in it how vain and how nonsensical is it to uh, you know to and then they'll be like humne ek film bana hai na we made one film on the queer community yeah but what did you do you misrepresented us you're not doing anyone a favor you know yeah i just i just think that it's 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 just unsettling sometimes today i'm getting good scripts i'll be honest with you i had never uh, you know um pictured myself to be an actor i was always a television host i was a performer i was a singer but never an actor i i dabbled in acting i did a couple of films and i did a couple of series but uh, i never considered myself but then i realized that it's just innately there you know it's not like i have to try so i said why not give it a shot and now i'm working with some of the best uh, production houses with some of the best new age directors that are writing amazing scripts i can't wait to share it with you when it happens uh, and but oh on the well oh my god something's releasing on tomorrow on uh, one of the biggest ott platforms in the world and i can't wait wow. so that's yeah. tomorrow like literally how time flies yeah so you know so <laughs> i was exciting. like yeah That's very exciting. I'm really glad to hear that there are yes, you know times are changing as you ask me times are changing. Are they changing as much or as fast or as we wanted to? Maybe not. I on would uh, honestly think you know there is no need to um right now the way it's going it's going in a good direction. Let me tell you that. Yeah. It's in the right direction. There are people who are there are heterosexual actors and stars and celebrities and artists that are standing for the queer community they are saying that please please don't misrepresent our queer brothers sisters and siblings so for me that's already a win win for yeah. me you know because they are not doing it so that they look like allies so that you know they get some endorsements and stuff they're not doing that because i can you know how after 15 years you can see through who's faking it yeah that's why yeah. i tell all all my dates also don't try and fake it with me i can see through it <laughs> yeah i'm really excited that you have all these new projects coming up i am i am definitely looking forward to them because you know like as you said like they always showed us as like these like lewd and lascivious kind of characters and then and then well lo and behold people start thinking of us like that way but at the same time you know we're often the ones who are who are at the most risk of being assaulted and both physically and sexually that it creates such a difficult situation and such a dangerous situation for us even in like dating you know right. what do you think we should do about this gaslighting that they keep doing with us um i think first of all uh we have to and i'm no shade no shade to uh you know uh the other dimensions within the community but hats off to my trans sisters trans brothers my drag family you know all over the world when i say drag queens and kings and drag artists hats off to people who are so visibly queer and out there because and and living normal lives just like anyone else hats off because I honestly think that they are the real stars each and every one of them because they give every other person that's closeted the the will to come out of the closet and live their best life so for me I think that they are the ones who should be celebrated first and what should we do about this gaslighting 
I think we should just rain all over it, you know, with our rainbow. <laughs> you know, we should just not take this anymore. We should not take, uh, you know, anybody gaslighting us and just getting away with it, thinking that, oh, we can, what will they do? Yellow kya karenge? You don't, yellow kya karenge? I will show you. You know, it's like that. And my thing is that you have to stand up for one another. That's another thing. In within the community, there's a lot of trans shaming. There's a lot of femme shaming. There's a lot of, um, you know, uh, preference shaming. There's a lot of color shaming. There's a lot of body shaming, slut shaming. Everything first happens within the community. Why should we go so much further? Let us talk about the community first. We have never given as much credit as our transgender sisters deserve. You know, even in, in the Indian context, I can guarantee you, what have we done? We should feel ashamed of ourselves for putting our transgender sisters on the streets. Yeah. We have ostracized them from society itself. Forget particular vocations. That comes much later. We pick them up like this, like this is male, female and transgender. We pick them up and thrown them in the bins. Yeah. And and now and now people and this happened specifically. I'm sorry I get so uh, you know, so uh, I, I feel so strongly about it. That's why I'm sorry if I'm, you know, coming off as uh, very intimidating or whatever. But I think that, you know, our trans sisters are able bodied, able minded. Today, the government has recognized transgender as the official third gender on paper. Well, India is one of the first countries to do that. But the mindsets are still there in the gutters. Where, what do we do about that? You can't just give us r laws and, and then not implement them. And we're still, my trans sisters are still standing today also as I'm sitting in, in the confines of this luxury. Yes, we might have worked for it. But today that I'm speaking here, every day I go to sleep thinking about my trans sisters on the streets that, are, that have to sell their bodies for a meal. Yeah. Or have to beg. That's not cool at all, you know. So this gaslighting is not going to help anything. Yeah, there's this like whole perception, you know, in the Western world that in India, uh, trans people have uh, like accepted, you know, because of the hijra community. And, you know, I want to go back to that because like prior to colonialism, yeah, there was, you know, India's mythology, there was like all these queer and trans deities, right? Um, and like, there's always been this huge hijra community in India. But, you know, prior to colonialism, right? Like, what do you think was the was the way that that our that the community was perceived prior to that colonial invasion? And then how did colonialism criminalize this expansiveness of our culture with gender and sexuality? You know, and and also like, why is it that even though we got independence back in 1947, we've still struggled to connect with that history? You know, you hit the nail on the, you hit hit it on the, you know, like the bullseye, can I say? Because it was colonialization that beeped it up, you know, they really, really like changed the game for, for the worse. Because they, I don't think colonial, uh, the colonial era, in, in during the colonial era, I don't think the British expected India to be so sexually evolved, firstly. And it has been, you know, also discussed by a lot of, uh, you know, historians that I think they had a culture, they had a culture shock because we were so accepting of trans people. It's not even funny. The Hijra community in our country is the oldest transgender community in the world. From there, today, you see them begging what changed? Obviously, it was called a colonialization and it was obviously their uh, ridiculous mindsets and draconian laws that they implemented on us. And they were they dehumanized us. They raped us. They molested us. They, you know, made sure that we starved. They, you know, uh, also they did not only just divide us on the basis of uh, religion and caste. They, they divided us on the basis of because of Section 377. They divided us on the basis of gender and orientation. Why don't people talk about that today? Why is it such? Why can't you just go back a little in history and see what happened to you and look at your frontline warriors that have fought this war? 
there are so many of them they are not remembered as freedom fighters today yes i know that a lot of me and my colleagues and my counterparts and you know a lot of people that i actively work with on ground level as well they will be will be remembered as frontline warriors for the start of this revolution in india but we are not celebrating anything unless we get complete equality we are not asking for special rights what have we asked you for you to lay the red carpet we don't want any of that we don't want reservation either we just want equal opportunity respect and dignity in society that's all we ask for regardless of whether i am straight gay transgender non binary that comes later i am paying my taxes i'm a productive member of this country and as a citizen of a democracy i must enjoy all the rights that any other person in this country should enjoy and that's what my constitution tells me now i don't know what these people's constitution tells them because they're reading the wrong one yeah you know and and i'm sorry today they sit on a moral high horse and tell us and apologize and say that and look at us like that and say you know but it's so like oh my god it's so you are so like underdeveloped you're an underdeveloped country third world country y'all are the ones who came and raped our women robbed us killed our children our, our fathers our grandfathers have you all forgotten that because there's no mention of that in his, history in graduate till your graduation level your students don't know all the atrocities your country as a whole has put so many other countries through and that changed the game but can i tell you something sara it's not just the britishers you can't just put all the blame on them yes they were terrible let me just put it out there back then they were terrible okay after that after they left after their you know you know we got we attained independence why did we continue with the laws that they created give me a good reason why we continued with the draconian you know horrible laws that dehumanize entire communities why did we continue with them when we call ourselves democracy we should not continue what another country had imposed on us we let go of that rule that law section in 2018 do you see how long it took and they made it look like it's part of our culture that queer people are not part of our culture i'm like no 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 you're getting it all twisted i am more indian than anybody else over here because india celebrated bharat before in before the colonial era celebrated diversity we prayed to gods that were diverse and fluid so don't tell me about i am not part of this country and i am not part of this culture ye to western hai you know you all are spoiling it because you all are getting western culture what is western culture what are you all talking you all are you are a democracy you are a sovereign state or a secular state liberal where is all this you are you know so we have to nip it in the bud because if it grows and grows and grows you know you can't then climb up on the tree and then start chopping because then you're going to also fall you know you have to just nip it in the bud because all this is going to happen otherwise and that's it's not it's never good for any society today you see society is changing today you see my trans sisters and brothers they are in positions of power they are in the parliament they are parliamentarians they congress people they are in the you know in even in the ruling party there are people who are working for transgender rights for working for queer rights there are lawyers doctors engineers high court supreme court and high court judges that are now transgender and i'm very proud of them teachers principals of schools in smaller towns that are that are transgender so times are changing but is this something we should sensationalize and celebrate no because even we have the same aspirations as someone else might have why do you have to put do i as a as a cisgender heterosexual person have you ever met someone who comes into the room and walks in and says imagining that you were cisgender heterosexual sara would you come into the room and say hi i am sara i'm straight <laughs> have you seen Never. anyone do that Never. So why does everybody see our gender as soon as we enter the room? Why is our gender and our orientation the talk of the town? I don't understand it. Yeah, it's um, it's it's frustrating that one of the ways to other people is to label them as something, then associate that label with something else that people already see as bad, and then. dehumanize them and then explain okay well now that they're dehumanized you know we can 
you know, commit atrocities against them and punish them and criminalize them. It's just, it's just, it's the same playbook, no matter where you go and no matter what kind of discrimination you see, it's always the same playbook. It's, it's frustrating. It is. And, you know, um, but as you mentioned, you know, you already like brought us to like the thing that I wanted to talk about to take stock of, you know, where we are, where we're going. Um, you know, you mentioned that like we we recently decriminalized homosexuality in India. We recently passed um, a, a a trans rights bill. Do you think with all of that, um, the conversation about LGBTQ plus rights has changed in India since then? With with a lot of mainstream LGBTQ icons like you becoming more prominently featured in these TV shows, especially TV shows that are seen by you know um, the millions and billions of Indians, right? In, in every small town, um, like how do we how do we see this 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 um, this fight for freedom, this fight for love, this 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 push for love moving forward? And and what's you know how do you see it? Ta- how do you see or, or how do you envision us taking this forward? Um, uh, you know, as you rightly mentioned, you know, trans uh, people are being represented. Uh, in multiple facets and vocations in society. But is it enough? Are we doing them a favor by including them? No, it's their right. If they have the, uh, if they have, uh, you know, if they have the vernacular and the aptitude, so be it, you know. And we are just like the face, you know, we are just, there we're just faces right the stories of you me them you know someone i'm pointing there there here here there because it could be anyone's story so i think that we need to be more empathetic and compassionate as individuals because that's the only way forward and yes there are things that are happening for the transgender community and it's about time it's about time because they have been shunned for so long that it, the least we can do is give them and repent for what they have, we have gone through as a community and just give them on a platter and say, at least this you take. And I'm, we are sorry that you had to go through this for all these years. So that, you know, we don't have to have somebody who has to leave their homes, leave, get on the street, you know, get into the sex trade. We don't want that. Yeah. You know, so we need to be more compassionate and empathetic, even as a society. I think, you know, even how you can be a better ally is by just being there for someone. You just hear them out, just give them, lend them a shoulder. And that's it. That's all. Yeah. So as you wrap up, uh, you know, we were talking about your music earlier. It's been so powerful for me. Um, you know, I used to sing when I was in school, when I was in like uh, middle school. But then, at, you know, I was singing in high school, but then after I transitioned, I struggled a lot with how my voice would be perceived. But then I listened to you and it just made me feel like I could sing again. It just, it made me feel so free. Uh, would you mind, just, mind giving us like just a small chance to hear your famous voice? Oh, of course, but only if you perform a little for us. <laughs> okay. And, and show us that lovely sari, Sara. You have to... FedEx it like as soon as we're done with this call and you can take whatever you want from my wardrobe because as as I told you the other day now you have now you are my sister so now you know sisters share wardrobes and I want yours first I want yours first as a vote of confidence (laughs) I actually had it shipped from Mumbai so like it came from there and then it'll go back there they go they go (laughs) Okay, if there are people watching us and, you know, uh, any suggestions of what song I should sing? Come on. Mm. Uh, Sara, tell me one of your... Give me three options so that I can pick one from that. Like, give me three okay. songs. Oh, just the other day, I was listening to Tal Se Tal Mila and that was really powerful. One. And then um, uh, the one that you always sing, Pia Tu Ab Tu Aja, that's always a perennial one. And oh gosh, I'm trying to think of a third one. Um, there's this new song, um, um, Ambar Sariya. Oh my god, I love Ambar Sariya. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. any of those. 
let's sing for you come on let's sing ambar sariya you know ambar sariya is actually sung by my mentor my uh, who was there on the show and she gave me the golden buzzer this is sona mohapatra so uh, this is for her and she's an amazing ally you know she's never she just told the other two judges wait i'm taking her i'm sorry just get out of my way i'm giving her the golden buzzer she's like you all can go home now because we got the winner and i was like no girl please please there's too much expectations out of me please don't do this so she was like just sing rani tu ga tu gana ga so for her i'm going to gana ga today okay and for you sara because you're looking gorgeous thank you oh gali mein mare phere pass aane ko mere gali mein mare phere pass aane ko mere कभी परखता नैन मेरे तू कभी परखता तो कभी परखता नैन मेरे तू कभी परखता तो अंबर सरिया मुंडिया वे कछिया कलिया ना तोड़ अंबर सरिया मुंडिया वे कछिया कलिया ना तोड़ तेरी माँ ने बोले है मुझे तीखे से बोल अंबर सरिया Om bar sariya Wow <laughs> That was so beautiful thank you so much thank you so thank much you so much today. thank you thank you Sara and it's been an absolute pleasure being here and uh, speaking with you as always is a pleasure but thank you so much for having me thank you so much for taking the time out to share your story with me and to help me share you know whatever the conversations we had with everyone so i want to thank you actually <laughs> and thank you for making such a wonderful effort like hats off like yes yes queen <laughs> thank you so much this was beautiful this was amazing i'm i'm sure our audience will love this